So I'd like to start with a story about containing costs in prescription drugs, and then what the United States government is proposing in the TPPA negotiations. Uh, again, these are rules that regulate governments and their ability to either regulate prescription drugs or offer to pay for, to reimburse people for the drugs that they otherwise purchase. And then a few oversight questions for you. <clears throat> So the history of cost containment story that I want to tell begins with the ref reflection that there was a period of time starting in the late 90s when Medicaid drug prices increased dramatically. And for a period of about 15 years, over a decade, you and the other states were seeing the portion of your Medicaid drug budget that you were paying for prescription drugs rise by an average of 13% per, per year. So you've lived this, and you've coped with it as a state budget question, and I'm sure you've, other committees have had hearings on what do we do about this? How do we give people the, you know, the beneficial drugs they need without seeing the prices go through the roof? It's literally a budget buster. So Maine was actually a leader going back into the late 90s in doing something about managing the escalating cost of these drugs. One thing you did, which was at the time controversial, was to ask the drug manufacturers for what you called a supplemental rebate. In other words, not only did you ask for a rebate from the drug company to reduce the effective cost for Medicaid recipients, but you asked for, them, for the drug companies to do so for people who were within another 15 percent of the, the income that would qualify them for Medicaid. In other words, you were helping people in the middle class, the bottom end of the middle supplemental rebate. <clears throat> the way that worked was that if a company did not offer the supplemental rebate, then they would have to go through a, a uh, prior authorization requirement, which was not a prohibition. It didn't keep them off a list for reimbursements. It just meant that the doctor prescribing a drug had to request a consultation with a state pharmacist before prescribing a drug that was not on the list are not covered by a supplemental rebate. This is sometimes referred to instead as a preferred drug list. Not as strong as what other countries are doing where they actually adopt a formulary and they say these are the only drugs we're going to pay for, but rather a consultation requirement built into the process. Um, and when states did this, they saved a lot of money. Um, Florida saved about 45 percent. The last number I read from Maine uh, was 50 percent, not all at once, but over a period of eight or nine years, the drugs actually reduced in price by half. So that was the first stage of this story, and it's really a success story, certainly in relative terms compared to price inflation elsewhere in the economy. The result was that the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, Pharma, sued the state of Maine. While they were at it, within the period of the same summer, they sued Michigan and Florida as well. Those states had similar but slightly different laws. And Pharma's argument was that, well, you're asking us to match supplemental rebates beyond the Medicaid population, and that's inconsistent with the Medicaid Act. You should be preempted from doing that. Went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, we don't think so. We think that extending the benefits of supplemental rebates is perfectly consistent with the purpose of Medicaid, which is to make drugs more affordable. And if you can help more people than just the Medicaid level, the Supreme Court is not going to stand in the way. We don't think Congress meant that you should be constrained in the way you bargain with drug companies. So this was the court deferring to bargaining power on the part of government, state government specifically in that case. Within four months of the losing that decision in the U.S. Supreme Court to the state of Maine, Pharma was working with U.S. trade negotiators to design, to design rules that would keep the same thing from happening in countries that have even stronger approaches to managing their, the cost of their prescription drugs, in this case specifically Australia. And the idea was that they would use the Australia Free Trade Agreement as a template for future trade agreements, which has indeed proved to be the case. Australia was the framework that appeared again in the Korea Free Trade Agreement and which appears yet again in the TPPA. So this is a story about what has come out of that initial litigation involving the state of Maine, and the answer is trade rules. If you don't succeed in the state legislature, 
If you don't succeed in the Congress, you go to the courts. And if you don't succeed in the courts, you go to the executive branch and you try to work through international trade rules. So as a result, federal reimbursement programs are covered by U.S. proposed trade rules on reimbursement. I'm not talking about direct purchases like by the Veterans Administration. I'm talking about reimbursement of drugs when federal agencies do it. And because it was unclear at the time of the Australia Agreement, the National Legislative Association on Prescription Drugs met with USTR. In fact, they met with Barbara Wiesel, who's now the head of the TPPA negotiations overall, and said to her, your proposed coverage of federal versus state programs is unclear to us. We want to make absolutely clear that Medicaid is not covered because it looks like a federal program, but we run it at the state level. So make clear that Medicaid is not covered. And that was successful. Now USTR is proposing similar provisions yet again for the TPPA. And the difference is they've left out the carve out for Medicaid. It's a conscious choice. They had to. <laughs> They knew, that he, they knew that you would be asking for it, and yet they left it out. It's, there's literally a placeholder in there that says, we have to decide what to put in here. So that's, that's the story. I could sit down right now. That's the big issue. But the details are kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> so let me see if I can keep you awake for this part. There are um, four elements to the US proposal on reimbursements. And this probably will sound familiar from your prior Medicaid debates. Um, the first one deals with market-derived prices. What the United States is asking of other countries is that the prices they set for purposes of reimbursement must, must be market-derived prices. And what's controversial about that is that it seems to leave out the role of government in the market. It's like take government out of the market. In fact, one of the analysts who've looked at this more closely than I it, thinks that they're, they intentionally mean to make clear that they're looking at market-derived prices in terms of direct-to-consumer marketing, the price that consumers are willing to pay on an open market without government using its heavier bargaining power to muscle down the prices of these pharmaceuticals. It also seems to be designed in a way that requires you to use market-derived prices in a country, in a specific country where the reimbursement is being provided, rather than looking at prices among many countries to see what the overall global level is. And what that tends to mean is that countries with higher incomes, people can afford to pay more for drugs. They can, be, uh, pay, they can afford to pay more for anything. So the prices are going to be relatively higher there. And so it means that these market-based prices will vary depending on the gross domestic product and the average income country by country. <clears throat> the second element is. Um, Australia and the government of Korea pushed back. They didn't want to be held to only a market-derived price as a standard for their reimbursement. So what came out was a compromise in which they have an alternative. Instead of using market-derived prices, prices have to be based on, a, on a, an approach that recognized the value of a patent. The problem with that is, what does it mean? Usually value is determined by a market somewhere. But here, we're talking about an alternative to market-based prices. So the problem with this proposal is that it invites litigation. It's, it's an open-ended question that, that surely will, will lead to a difference of opinion as to what the value of a patent is when there are generics on the market that, that can and are being used to treat the same disease or syndrome or problem. The next standard is. Another alternative for setting prices is a price that recognizes superior safety, efficacy, or quality. These are all arguments that a pharmaceutical company could, be, could use to argue that the price you're paying for reimbursement on my drug should be higher because my drug has a patent and it's better in this way or better than that way than what existed before it. So it's a way to ratchet up the price. <clears throat> What's noticeable about if you look at this list is that it leaves out cost. And it leaves out any consideration of whether the government even has the resources to pay for, to pay more money for a drug, even if it is better, even if it is safer, even if it is better quality. So there's a question in my mind as to whether this qualification, this criterion, really amounts to an entitlement program for any company that has a patent that's better than the other drugs on the market. <clears throat> Finally, it covers additional medical indications. That is to say, 
It's an obligation to reimburse even for uses of a drug that have not been certified as safe and effective by the medical authorities of a country, in our case, the Food and Drug Administration. It seems to be detached from those prior regulatory decisions. Why else would it be there? So those are the issues in terms of the uh, reimbursement. Now, the big argument, or the even bigger argument, is about coverage of the U.S. proposal, and I'm I guess apologetic about putting so many words in your face, but it really comes down to this. You can read the language on the screen. The U.S. proposal applies, that is the proposal for the price rules I just described, applies to the extent that healthcare authorities of a party's central level of government maintain procedures for listing uh, pharmaceutical products. So that, in theory, could apply to Medicaid because there's a federal, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services do, in fact, have procedures for the states to follow when they're setting uh, their benchmarks for reimbursement. And it also covers um, products or medical devices under health care programs operated by the central level of government. In that regard, Medicaid is ambiguous. It's a national program under federal legislation following federal rules but administered by the states in which the states also have decision-making authority over the rates of reimbursement. So to take this apart a little bit more, let's focus on the accomplishment of the last round of negotiations where legislators from Maine and other states, really under the leadership of Representative Sharon Treat, um, saw that there was ambiguity here and pushed for footnote two. And in the TPPA, here's what footnote two says. Negotiators note, Clarifying footnote regarding scope of application, such as with respect to central versus regional government, regional, central versus regional level of government. So there's a placeholder for an exception that might look like, whoops, wrong direction, might look like this. This is the comparator and the Australia Free Trade Agreement. A very clear statement that Medicaid is a regional program and not a central government program. This language means very clearly the trade agreement does not apply to Medicaid. End of argument. Why not just keep it? So there's your oversight question. No mystery. Why did you not stick it in there? Clearly. Why the step back? <laughs> well, could I ask what's your speculation as to why they did it this way? Industry pressure? Why, why would they step back? It's the head of negotiations for the entire agreement is the person who put in footnote two. She clearly knows why it's there. She's the one that talked to Sharon Treat and Peter Riggs and the other people that were saying this is a problem. So somebody's asking for it not to be there. <clears throat> Let's go back to the top part. The language about setting the amount of the reimbursement. There are some federal programs even though they're not paid for by you, that benefit you, the state government. And based on my conversations with Sharon and some other analysts, I've taught myself a little bit about the so-called 340B federal program. And while it's completely federal, apparently it offloads a lot of Medicaid spending that what you would otherwise have to pay for. So on the country, in the country as a whole, there are roughly 17,000 health facilities that qualify for this. And if they choose to, they can write and get reimbursements for uh, pharmaceutical expenditures on behalf of Medicaid-eligible patients. And when that happens, those patients are not coming to you and seeking you to reimburse them as a Medicaid recipient. Um, <clears throat> I tried to get it. I didn't have a number on exactly how much Maine saves, per se, but I, I did see numbers from other states, and it's in the range of $1 to $5 million. So I assume you're on the low end, but it's still a significant amount of savings. So you may care about this program. It's clearly covered by this rule to use something other than the government's market power or even cost-benefit analysis as compared to a market-derived price. Now, I'm not saying that the 340 program is going to have the bottom fall out, but I'm saying if they're held to a market price standard, what's going to happen? It's not at all clear. They, they will be under pressure to alter their approach. The other program that has less of an impact on your own Medicaid budget 
but which might be of interest to your constituents is Medicare Part B. It similarly seeks below Medicaid levels of reimbursement for individuals. And so there are a lot of people who are um, higher income than Medicaid who benefit from Medicaid, for, rather from Medicare Part B. Um, these are reimbursements uh, to doctors and hospitals who are effectively buying the drugs on behalf of the people they're taking care of. So I guess I'm just learning the Medicare lingo. I guess Part C is where the individuals get the benefit of a reimbursement, whereas Part B covers the institutional purchases. Finally, in this chapter, there is a proposal on direct marketing, and the language of interest is that parties shall permit a pharmaceutical product manufacturer to disseminate to health professionals and consumers through the manufacturer's internet site and on other internet sites. And what's interesting about this is it allows for marketing through internet sites other than the manufacturer in an indirect way, so for example through social media, liking a product on, on Facebook for example, which I don't honestly understand but I hear it talked about a lot. So that kind of indirect marketing, Angie's List for example is about services where people testify about they like this service or that. You could have people on a third party internet site saying, this drug worked great for me, I got all my hair back in 15 minutes. I would buy that drug. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's the worry. Um, these are the critiques of it. First, direct-to-consumer marketing is prohibited in some countries, I believe including some TPPA countries, but I don't have specific information. Number two, off-label marketing is an issue even within the United States. And while this is not a directly related to off-label marketing, it, contribute, it could contribute to the problems of off-label marketing. And finally, it's an aspect of cost control. Direct marketing to consumers does drive market demand for drugs, does tend to increase prices. And while it may be the market at work and maybe getting people exactly what they're willing to pay for, here we're talking about the government paying for it, in part. So it's a way for drug companies to be pushing the demand that increases the price, prices, that sets the ben benchmark for the government to reimburse um, for the purchase of the drug. So it goes full circle back to you in part. Um, and the question is, the, the oversight question, I believe, is whether this kind of provision um, will constrain options for future cost containment strategies at the federal level or at the state level. This is probably a federal level issue because of the nature of the economy and the, the issue of regulating drugs. It's more effectively done at the federal level. So uh, to conclude, I think we've covered most of these oversight questions, but the, the one about cost to states is whether the TPPA would undermine cost containment in either Medicaid or the 340B program. It's clearly designed to in the 340B program. It's supposed to change business as usual. How would that work? What's the scenario? I've not seen a market scenario for how operation of these rules would alter 340B. Maybe the negotiators would say there's no change that we anticipate, but the rules in this annex are not the same way that the 340B program negotiates its reimbursement rates. So who would bring a claim, if anyone, and how would it affect that program? Uh, and with Medicaid, the question is simple. Why not keep the old footnote too, which is very clear and exactly what the states have asked for? The broader question is, are these really the right pricing rules? I don't have any expectation that since the United States proposed these rules, it's going to back off of them. They've not been rules that are welcomed by countries like Australia and New Zealand. So are there, you know, what's the alternative? Do you think that the United States could, should back off of its annex completely? Why not follow the approach to Medicaid reimbursement that the state of Maine follows already? It's not as robust as Australia or New Zealand that use hard and fast formularies and say we're only going to reimburse you for certain drugs based on our analysis of costs and benefits. So you're paying more than Australia would, but you're paying less than, much less than the so-called market-based price. Why not have federal agencies do it the way you do it, across the board? So you know it was a big debate. When this all came up in terms of Medicare Part C, it was highly partisan. It's not a new issue for Congress. It's not a new issue for the states. So I realize I'm asking you to perhaps take on a, an old, 
highly politically fraught issue, but it's out there. And it happens to be an issue that the states have a lot of experience on. The state programs save money. Drug companies would make less, and you understand their arguments. If they have less profit, they have less money to reinvest in research and well, <clears throat> what they call uh, providing greater access. Future cost containment, some of these proposals would affect the ability of you or Congress to adopt cost constraints in the future. And as I said in the paper, I do think there's probably bipartisan agreement that costs are out of control in terms of uh, the medical care system, pharmaceuticals as well as services, and the country has yet to seriously tackle how to get those costs under control. Uh, do we want to put handcuffs on legislatures at a time when they should be searching for creative alternatives and looking at the examples from other countries to figure out how to manage our health care system so we can retain quality without seeing prices escalate faster than any other country? And then finally, the question on direct marketing. Same question. Um, one of the proposals before Congress, a bill by Congressman Henry Waxman, seeks to limit direct marketing for a certain period of years right after a drug hits the market. And the theory of that is that the first three or so years are when mistakes are likely to be noticed. So a drug has been approved by the Food and Drug, I mean, yeah, a drug has been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. People are buying it now, but more data comes in and oftentimes there are recalls or, you know, changes in the uh, recipe for the drug based on actual experience. So this would be kind of a shakedown period, <coughs> an added measure of uh, an added margin for safety. Those are the questions I see. Some of these price standards do have efficacy or safety elements to them. So to that extent, they, they allow governments to use rational consideration of results. But when you consider safety or efficacy and not price also, see, in the abstract, you would always want a safer, more effective drug. But the price question comes in when you then compare that drug to alternatives, which are older, perhaps generics, and maybe they don't work as well, but maybe they accomplish, at least for some indications, uh, sufficient therapeutic benefits that you're willing to pay for those and not the newer drug. That's exactly the game that Australia's in, and that's the game that the drug companies do not want to play. Uh, add to that the bargaining power of government, and you can see what I meant earlier by the theme of who gets to use bargaining power. The pharmaceutical companies want to define market power as their power to shape the market to sell a patented drug that they've created or expanded um, with their marketing with their marketing power to achieve market power to set the price. Government wants to use the, the power of purchasing in great volumes. And as you've seen the states do, there are a number of actual regional pooling arrangements between state Medicaid programs that the states are trying to make themselves bigger purchases than they could do on their own as an individual state. So there's real power on both sides, and this trade agreement takes sides. Yes to... Hmm? Yes to pharma power, no to government power. Um, the way the Australian health advocates analyzed it, Professor Tom Fonts from the Australian National University said that it's, if you stand back and look at the whole package, it takes what used to be thought of as a public goods program. How can we buy beneficial drugs on the largest scale possible to reduce the prices and turns it into a system of individual company rights so that the lawyers get involved in every stage of the process from setting the price benchmark to deciding what the reimbursement should be for an individual drug to a, an appeal process based on any one of these four price setting criteria. Joseph. I have two things. One, the hmm. pharmaceutical companies are not obligated to sell to the government at the prices the government requires. That's what the Supreme <clears throat> Court said. They're not obligated. Right, so they can just walk away, and right. so I don't hold much sympathy for the pharmaceutical companies if they don't like what they're not getting for their pricing. But <clears throat> um, more importantly, <clears throat> unlike the tobacco, I do not see how this promotes trade, which is what this TPPA is supposed mm -hmm. to be about. Promotes sh shifts in market share. Right. But it, 
it doesn't do anything for trade or even increasing the, the use of, of pharmaceuticals themselves. It just, it, it, to me, it, it's, it seems like it's just legislation for the interest of one industry. Yes. <laughs> am I reading, am I understanding that correctly? I think so. Okay. So. I've, I have quoted the industry's position in the paper version. They say uh, the objective is to increase the availability of high quality and innovative drugs. So they want you to understand that in their mind there's a connection between their ability to get premium prices or to maintain their price levels they've established in the market through their marketing and their ability to invest in the drugs of the future. That's their argument. So it's nothing to do with trade. Be the guise of a trade agreement, in my humble opinion. Well, if you, you were to right, so. if you were to think about a logical.